Grand Theft Auto Biography is brought to you by my incredible supporters on Patreon. And a special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Mo S, XX Anti Tricks Never Sorry 17XX, Wiggly Pizza Pants, Ezra Hambrick, and Mason Collin. If you want to support the channel, one of the best ways you can do it is by joining my Patreon and supporting those who support me. All patrons at all tiers receive access to all of the perks listed on screen for only $2 Canadian a month, or less than $2 US a month. But for those extra generous few who decide to pledge at the executive producer tier level, you can also promote your own content. Today's episode is sponsored in part by my executive producers Ezra Hambrick and Mason Collin. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games like Red Dead Redemption 2, MLB The Show 22, Vice City Definitive Edition, and more. As well as Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything, from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Support the show by showing them some love, and without further ado, enjoy today's episode. Warning, this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Regime building, drug dealing, and corruption at the highest levels. Tonight we will take a look at a brief window of time in the life of one of our most mysterious subjects on GTA Biographies to date. We will follow the actions of a government man embroiled in Latin American affairs, who used any means necessary to fund his operations, and the unlikely relationship he formed with one of the state's most notorious criminals, which gave us this glimpse into his otherwise undocumented career. We will see government-sponsored narcotics trafficking, inter-agency rivalries, and domestic terrorism, allegedly, as we examine the known life and crimes of the G-Man spook, Mike Torino. regular viewer of GTA biographies will know that more often than not, we are forced to fill in the gaps with speculation when discussing the early lives of our subjects. Tonight, that is doubly true, as nearly all information obtainable on Mike Torino comes from his time in association with the well-documented criminal Carl C.J. Johnson. Taking what little info we do have, we can make some assumptions on how Torino wound up where he was by the time he became acquainted with the Grove Street Gangster. We assume Mike Torino was born shortly after World War II, likely 5 to 10 years after, given his apparent age of late 30s to early 40s by 1992. Absolutely nothing is known about his early life, where he was born, or who his parents were, but based on accent, we speculate he was raised somewhere in the southwestern United States, such as Utah, or even San Andreas itself. Eventually, though it's entirely unclear at what age, Mike would start a career in the government, almost certainly at the CIA, based on his later modus operandi, his own words, and the fact that he neglected to mention the CIA when listing the agencies watching him to Carl Johnson. would quickly work his way up through the ranks of the agency and attain a clearance level high enough to begin planning and executing his own large-scale operations. It's possible Mike's clearance levels were so high that he had direct contact with the President of the United States himself, though this remains unconfirmed and is based solely on his later conversations with Carl, which may have been entirely exaggerated to convince the reluctant gangster, or we may simply be misinterpreting. Like many of the CIA's operations around this time, Mike would become involved in funding and supporting Latin American regimes that supported U.S. interests, and on the inverse, tearing down regimes which stood in opposition to the U.S. 
He would establish contacts through his wet work and espionage all across the Latin world, and by early 1992 be given clearance, or simply take his own initiative, to begin his most ambitious operation yet, this time domestically. In furtherance of his and his boss's agendas, Mike would come up with a scheme to fund CIA operations in Latin America by using his already established contacts to begin selling drugs back in the US. He would, through unknown means, begin to form an underground organization, with the intent to distribute cocaine all across San Andreas. Establishing himself in the bayside city of San Fierro, Mike would recruit muscle for the organization through San Fierro Rifa leader T-Bone Mendez, as well as the pimp Jizzy B, to help facilitate connections in the state's underworld. And with that, the Loco Syndicate would be born. It isn't known exactly when the Syndicate formed, or under what circumstances, and it's possible it had already been in operation on a smaller scale prior to the 1990s. But whatever the case, by 92, Torino would be prepared to step up production to make even more funds available for his Latin American affairs. And to that aim, he would find a new buyer prepared to take as much as 100 keys a month off of their hands, should things go as planned. As it turns out, that buyer was the Balos gang of Los Santos just a few hours away, and may have even been Melvin Big Smoke Harris himself of the Grove Street families, who would go on to be the city's cocaine kingpin. It isn't clear if Harris and Torino were in direct contact or not though, and given that this deal was apparently established before Smoke's public betrayal of the GSF, we can't be entirely certain it was him at all. Torino's involvement with the Los Santos-based suppliers would eventually put him in the scope of Carl Johnson, who, now living out of San Fierro himself, was conducting espionage of his own to find a way into the syndicate in order to dismantle it. Carl and his sister's boyfriend Cesar Villalpando would follow a Balas car to Angel Pine in Whetstone to observe a deal between Loco Syndicate members, including Mike Torino. Although unaware of who he was or his importance to the organization at the time, this would technically be the pair's first encounter, and would be one of the only times Carl managed to get the drop on the G-Man. CJ would eventually learn more about the Syndicate, including its actual name, through his contacts in the Mountain Cloud Boys, namely their boss, Wootsie Moo, otherwise known as Woozy. Woozy and his lieutenant Guppy would put CJ on the trail of Jizzy B, and with minimal convincing, Carl would manage to get himself hired by the pimp as Dumb Muscle to assist T-Bone and Mike with whatever they needed doing. Carl's true introduction to Mike would come under rather unfortunate circumstances for Torino, when a routine drug shipment is stolen by the Vietnamese gangsters, the Da Nang Boys, with Mike still inside the van. Mike! Mike! I've been trying to contact you! What? Oh man, who are you? Okay, just keep talking. Hey, Holmes, Mike's in trouble. Let's bounce. What trouble? Who was Mike? Man, they taking the yay shipment and the van, and Mike's still in the back. Well, what are we gonna do? How the fuck we gonna know where he's he is? He's got his phone. He's gonna talk to us till his battery runs out. Come on, we gotta bounce. All right, let's jet. With his phone battery dying, Mike would relay instructions to T-Bone, who would in turn direct CJ until the pair located Mike at Easter Bay Airport and dealt with the troublesome thieves. Hey, man, come on, hurry up. Apurate, apurate. About time, T-Bone. Who the fuck is this? Hey, that's one of Jizzy's clowns. Relax, Weddle. You hear that? We gotta torch this van with the coke in it. Hey, Charlie, Weddle, we ain't torching nada. This is a setback, but doing 20 to life is a little more than that. Comprende, amigo? Hey, he right, man. Let's do it and get the hell out of hey, here. Hey, who the fuck asked you, payaso? This ain't a committee. Exactly. I call the shots here. Now shut up and let's go. Though Mike had been rescued, he would immediately be hyper-cautious about CJ's presence, already suspecting that the organization was being watched, and using his authority as head of the syndicate to try and confirm Carl's identity and cover story. How long you been working for Jizzy? I haven't seen you before. Just got into town last week. I've done a couple jobs here and there. Just got into town, huh? Where were you before that? Hey, what is this? Man, just answer the fucking question. Look, man, chill. I've been in Los Santos with my family, all right? Give me his wallet. What? Hey, get off! Quit struggling and concentrate on the road. Here you go, Mike. Carl Johnson, huh? All right, I've seen enough here. Hey, it was a dub in there. Better still be there when I check it. Shut the fuck up. Okay, Carl Johnson. You did good today. Man, now shake the spot. We got shit to talk about. Both Torino and T-Bone would continue to test CJ and ensure he was not working for a rival organization or government agency, but without actually needing to lie, Carl would insist he wasn't working for anyone except himself. 
Facing increased pressure from the Da Nang boys, attempting to steal or block their shipments, Torino would hire Carl to protect a supply run to the factory in Doherty, and CJ would once again prove his usefulness to the group. Man, where the hell are everybody anyway? Ah, uh, hey! You a pinchy uh, hoot or what? Uh, what the hell? You think you can mess with uh, me? Uh, I, I will blow your head off and rape and kill your family, you snake! Uh, you think you can fucking bullshit me and fuck me over? Uh, I know your uh, fucking game, uh, Messi. I don't know what you're talking about, man. Ah, my throat! Who you working for? Nobody! Turn around and look at me. <coughs> man, I'm just trying to make some money. Keep my mouth shut, I swear, man. <laughs> I almost had you, man. I almost fucking had you. <coughs> Watcha? You gotta be careful in this business, man. You know that. Are you boys done playing around? Yeah, we're straight, Bottle. Oh, good. That's great. Now, we gotta go meet this shipment. We're late as it is. Let's go. You heard what Heffa said. Get out and grab a bike. The shipment has to get to the factory. You make sure it does, we make it worth your while. We're watching you, kid. See more, Nessie. We're watching. But even with all of Mike's inside knowledge, he would apparently not be suspicious enough of Carl to find his connections to Big Smoke back in Los Santos, and thus his motivation. Carl would go on to confront and murder Jizzy B without notifying the rest of the syndicate, and steal his phone to learn of an upcoming meeting, this time taking place at Pier 69. Presumably still unaware of Jizzy's death and therefore CJ's betrayal, Mike would head to the meeting via helicopter, but almost immediately noticed the rooftops littered with bodies as Carl and Caesar had already made their move and crashed the party. Chopper inbound! That's gotta be Torino! Oh shit, he'll see the bodies on the rooftops! It's too late, man, he's tripping out, Holmes! Smoke grenades? So much for a surprise. Come on, we gotta take these fools right now. Finally aware of CJ's true allegiances, and more importantly his skills as a gunman and a spy, Torino would retire to presumably his ranch in Tierra Robata, serving as either a local CIA safe house or possibly Mike's personal home. Knowing that Carl had already killed all the remaining members of the Syndicate's leadership besides himself, Torino's next move would be to protect Carl's. He would orchestrate a staged scenario using what we assumed to be a body double, and convince CJ's source of info, Woozy, that Mike and his men were cutting up a helicopter at a helipad downtown, giving CJ a perfect opportunity to strike. Carl, it's Woozy. I've got some information for you. Hey Woozy, what's the business? My man found that van you were looking for by the helipad downtown. And Torino? Yep, he's there. Apparently he's about to take some merchandise and cut up a helicopter. They've already started loading boxes. Something about Torino don't add up. Holler back if you hear something. Just as Mike predicted, Carl would ambush the helicopter as it was preparing to leave and chase it all the way across the San Fierro Freeway, eventually destroying it and in his mind, killing Torino once and for all. Not quite finished yet, Carl would go on to destroy the Syndicate's former crack factory in Doherty to officially put them out of business. Meanwhile, Mike Torino would perform a more than thorough background check on Carl, we assume, as by their next meeting he would know practically everything there was to know about the LS gangster, including a few things that even he didn't know. It is possible, however, that Mike had done his homework on CJ much earlier and had been watching to see what he would do from the moment he met him. However, given Mike's reliance on the income from the Loco Syndicate to fund his operations, we believe it is more likely that CJ had genuinely fooled Torino, at least for a brief time before his assassination of Jizzy B. Shortly after Carl's destruction of the crack factory, Mike would phone CJ from his Tierra Robata ranch using a voice scrambler to mask his identity. He would order Carl to visit him at his ranch if he wanted answers, and CJ would eventually relent. Speak on it. This is a friend of yours. I've got some information relating to your brother. Come to my ranch and I'll explain. 
If in Chiara Robota, cross the Garber Bridge, head south. Who the fuck is this? I can't talk right now. Get your ass over here. Mom's always told me not to talk to strangers. And look what happened to the bitch. Now if you want your brother to go to sleep tonight with his tongue intact, get your ass over here. Goodbye. When Carl finally arrived at the ranch, Mike would continue to hide his identity behind the voice scrambler and instruct him to perform an off-road driving test to ensure he was up to one of the real jobs he had in mind for the gangster. Carl, darling, welcome. So fucking welcome, man. What you know about my family? Now first we need to see what you're made of. What it look like I'm made of? Pudding? No, anger and hate. And that's what I like about you. Hey, there's a truck in the garage. I say we take it for a spin. After proving himself fully capable of handling even a monster truck in the uneven hills of Bone County and Tierra Robata, Mike would be prepared to reveal himself to Carl, and attempt to explain his role in the way he saw it, protecting American democracy. Who the fuck is this? Son, get back to the ranch, and I'll explain everything. And I mean everything. Can't you just tell me now? I guess not. Hey, Carl. Hey, what the fuck, man? Hey, Torino, I, I told you my bad, man. What the hell can I say? I screwed you up. Calm over. down, kid. Just go ahead and kill me then. Calm down. Man, you ain't number the fucking Yayo dealer anyway, Torino. Shut up and sit down. Well, you think I'm a drug dealer? And you think you're a crusader for good? Do you have any idea what's going on? Any idea whatsoever? Do you? Do you? Nah, I pay as little attention to things as possible. Do not be a fucking smart ass with me. I work for a government agency. It is not important which one. I will try not to confuse you. Yes, when we last met, I was involved in battling threats in Latin America by any means necessary. That does not make me a drug dealer. Now, the money that we raised, the friends that we won over, have helped us immeasurably in our overseas interests. Government agency? Kids like you, you expect heroes. We're fighting a war out there. I'll be a hero and I'll lose. And what do we have? Communism in Ohio. People sharing. Nobody buying stuff. That kind of bullshit. So relax and listen. All right, all right. I'm listening. I know what kind of guy you are. I need a guy like you. To do things I can't get caught doing. Like what? I need you to commandeer a truck. A rival agency with a confused social agenda. They got things that we need. Now this is a two-man job. You'll need a friend. Use your sister's boyfriend, but don't tell him a thing. Remember, I'll be watching you. Carl and Caesar would manage to stop and procure the speeding tanker truck along the San Fierro Highway and deliver it to CJ's Doherty Garage for temporary storage. Exactly which agency Mike and his bosses were targeting with the hijacking, what was inside the tanker, or what it was needed for by either party are still all mysteries. Perhaps more importantly to Mike than the tanker, however, was Carl proving he could be relied upon for more intense and demanding grunt work. He would dangle his brother's freedom just out of reach in order to continue convincing CJ that cooperation was in his and his brother's best interest. Roger that big monkey, I got a 13-6 fat vulture, need to acquire a drowning baby, over. What? In 15 by the fat moon, break your heart, over and out. Carl, I need you to do me a favor. Yeah, I'll do you a proper injury, man. What you knowing about my brother? <laughs> Relax. He's in prison upstate. D-wing, cell 13. To the left, I got a child killer who wants to rip his throat out. To the right of him, I got a white supremacist who wants to eat his heart, to be precise. Now, don't worry. Tenpenny and Pulaski are really relatively benign, unless, of course, you're a family member of Officer Pendleberry, whom they shot when he threatened to expose them, but you do know all about that, right? <laughs> Damn! Hey, man, how you know all this stuff, man? And won't you stop it? You just don't understand, do you, kid? Look, it's all white knights and heroes. We have to make decisions, kid. You know, I try to set bad people on other bad people, and sometimes I let good guys die. He's your brother, but to me, he's just collateral. 
It's a very delicate decision. Over here, you got all the scumbags inside the country. And over here, you got all the scumbags outside the country. And me and my colleagues, we're the fucking pivot. Keep the government in work. Which reminds me, come here, okay? I need you to head over here in the buggy outside, okay? Okay, let off a flare. We got some precious cargo needs collected. Hey, hold up. What about my brother and all that shit you was talking hey, about? Hey, don't worry. Sweet's just fine. He gets touched. A prison guard goes home and finds that his wife and kid have been murdered. Everything's under control. We'll talk later. Now, come on, get out of here. Mike would send Carl to Las Brujas, near El Castillo del Diablo, and proceed to guide CJ to his intended destination, in order to signal a helicopter for a drop. Jesus, what took you? To Reno! Where you at? Miles away. No time for niceties, kid. Choose a vehicle, grab the equipment I provided, get to that drop zone, and wait for that package. Unfortunately for CJ, but likely unsurprisingly to Torino, the helicopter would be ambushed by presumably the same rival government agency whom Carl had robbed with Caesar, and CJ would be forced to defend the cargo from incoming fire. That's our cargo, arriving now! Jesus! Will you stop doing that? Carl would skillfully down all the attack helicopters and give the cargo chopper a chance to release the package for collection. Upon retrieving the package, Torino would one more time surprise Carl with his seemingly all-encompassing knowledge and remind CJ that his eyes and ears were everywhere. Okay, get the package back to Las Brujas. Where are you? You giving me the heebie-jeebies, man. Carl, I will always be watching or listening or both. With Carl's success at safeguarding the cargo for CIA retrieval, CJ would come under international scrutiny by various intelligence agencies the world over. He would have a hit placed on his head and very nearly be tracked down and tortured by Russian spies, and Mike would use this frightening knowledge as a slightly bigger stick while continuing to promise the carrot of his brother's early release in exchange for even more involved wet work. Here, now, don't screw around. What a asshole. It's amazing. What's up now, Torino? This history, it's all lies. It says Hitler killed himself, and then we nuked Japan. And people believe this shit. <laughs> Jesus. Well, if it makes them sleep better at night, I guess. Hey, man, what did you want? Is you gonna free my brother? No. Not now. And here's a little news flash. I said that to get you to do something for me. Man, you real fucked up. But the shocker is, we are gonna look after him. Because I need him alive as much as you do. Oh, thanks. You know, after what you've done for me, it's like you're a pro now. I got double agents in Panama. I want to put a price on your head. A Russian spy. Little fat Boris-looking guy. He's asking for clearance to interrogate you. Russian style. Calipers on the genitals. Feels good. You'd like it. That ain't nothing cool, man. Just leave me alone, you bad news. Don't worry about it. The Russians got bigger things to worry about than your genitals, believe me. The whole country went to shit. You know, we tried hard to put a lid on it, but that idiot Gorbachev with his little strawberry in his forehead, he gave away the crown jewels. Still, they got their, you know, their boy in the White House. That was nice. So? What you want me to do? Now listen, I need you to buy me some property, okay? Shouldn't cost that much. You offer them a dollar. If they give you a hard time, kill them. I'm gonna need you to start doing some real wet work here for me soon, okay? Enough of this little girl bullshit. Now get out of here. Come on, beat it. Ready to really put Carl to work for the agency, Mike would have him purchase, with his own money of course, an airstrip in Bone County for Torino's planned domestic operations. Needing a flight-ready soldier who could operate under the radar, quite literally, Mike would instruct Carl to use the training tapes of the airstrip to learn how to fly, and with little other choice, Carl would do just that. Well, Carl, so what do you think of our new base of operations? It's missing something. Maybe a tennis court and a pool would help motivate me better. Very nice call, very cute. Uh, so listen, now, <clears throat> you're gonna have to learn how to fly. No, I ain't. Yes, actually you are. 
I set out a series of tests for you. You can access them on that TV. You're going to have to prove to me that you can fly if you're going to continue working towards your brother's freedom. Shit. Whatever, man. Very nice. CJ's first task from Mike after learning the art of aviation would involve delivering urgently needed supplies across the state to agents in Angel Pine without being detected by radar systems. Mike would ambush CJ at the hangar to make a point about CJ's attentiveness and once more explain his government mindset before sending Carl on yet another dangerous mission. Get you again, Carl! You're half asleep. I could have killed you in nine different ways. Wake up and smell the coffee. You need to lay off the coffee. We got a problem. I got some guys out in the field need some equipment. If they don't get it, they'll be dead by nightfall. Then take it to them! Me take it to them? Yeah, why not? I got five guys watching me all the time. I got two in that hill, one over there, and two by satellite. If I go, my guys and I will be dead. I don't have a death wish. I'm a man of peace, son. Yeah, clear. Take the plane. Now, you're not ready yet, so stay low under the radar. Questions? Yeah, just one thing. Get to I it. Wait, hey, listen. Listen to me for once. Why won't these guys come after me? Oh, they can't, because they're all posted on me. One DEA, one FBI, a Russian, a Cuban double agent, and my paymasters. Checks and balances. Nobody is watching anybody watching nobody. Know what I mean? Go. Whatever, man. Using a Rustler one-seater airplane, small enough to go mostly unnoticed, CJ would fly all the way from Bone County to Whetstone to deliver the supplies to the agents, dodging telephone poles, weather, and even trees which seemed to come into view just moments before it was necessary to counter-maneuver. Hey Carl, you gotta stay nice and low on your approach or pop up on the radar. Use the canyon to cover. You sure this thing is safe? I can see daylight through the floor. Yeah, that thing looks like an enthusiast. The US Air Force is less likely to shoot you down. Cool. What's the problem then? I said less likely. As usual though, CJ would pull it off, continuing to impress Torino and presumably his bosses, depending on how aware they were of his uses thus far. Nice going, Carl! Really, you did good, kid. But Carl's skills would truly be put to the test when another rival agency, possibly the same one Carl had already been fighting on the CIA's behalf, would use CJ's airstrip for a stop-off in order to load a shipment of landmines they planned to offload in the Middle East. It seems very likely that this was the real reason Mike had CJ purchase the airstrip to begin with, having Carl purchase the deed to avoid suspicion, as we cannot imagine any other logical reason for this otherwise risky landing at an unguarded civilian airstrip. Ah, what's Torino up to now? I'm feeling a little exposed here. Being the nearly unstoppable and cunning gangster that he was, Carl would manage to get aboard the fleeing cargo plane before it could take off, and proceeded to eliminate all personnel in the cargo bay before planting explosives inside and bailing out the back. Carl had proven he was not only a useful asset, but possibly one of the most reliable and deadly contractors the CAA had on tap, all without a pension. What's your take on this? Damn! I thought them was your people. Listen, Carl, we've got a problem. Some traitors from another department think they can help the overseas situation by financing militaristic dictators in exchange for arms contracts. Hey, ain't that exactly what you do? Well, kind of, but we get to pick our dictators. Degenerates that we can control. We try to stay the hell away from these guys with principles, because that just muddies the waters. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, of course, these idiots have stolen a consignment of landmines and they plan to offload them in the Middle East and cause a little rocket scenario. It's crazy and have a lot of problems. I mean, Carl, do you like maiming people? I'm curious. Maiming? Some people? Shit. Anyway, the point is, you and me, Carl, hey, we're the same. Now, yeah, it's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it. But if you screw this up, it causes a tinderbox situation all over Latin America and the Middle East. Now, look, I spoke to the big man. You got clearance to eliminate these fuckers. How's that? Huh? Man, kill government agents. <laughs> kill Schmidl. Come on, don't, don't look at it that way. Well, yeah, think of it as pest control. It works for me. All right, come on. I can't stay here now. I'm too hip. I gotta go. Okay? I'm out of here.
Following Carl's unlikely but nonetheless successful mission in taking down the rival agency, Mike would vanish from CJ's life for a time, and return to doing whatever it is secret government agents do. Based on his previous actions, it seems more than likely that Torino would go about re-establishing a means of funding his operations, with the Loco Syndicate dismantled thanks to his new Grove Army Knife and CJ. Whatever he did get up to, he would continue to operate domestically in his crusade against the forces of evil or something. In this battle of Morally Ambiguous Agency 1 versus Morally Ambiguous Agency 2, Mike would have one more use for CJ, which also may have been the real reason for his wanting him to obtain a pilot's license. We cannot know for certain how many of the large-scale operations that Mike sent Carl on were planned and known about in advance, but given his actions later on, it seems likely to our investigative team that Carl's work in Bone County, his takedown of the cargo plane at the airstrip, and Mike's final task had all been planned operations, which were just waiting for the perfect neutral party to execute. While enjoying his newfound fame and success back in Los Santos, operating out of his new client Mad Dog's mansion in the Vinewood Hills, Torino would finally manage to contact CJ again presenting him with his most elaborate and deadly mission yet, one that would thankfully, if done correctly, earn his brother his freedom. Damn. Hey, what happened? Hey, what the snail's that? I don't know, bruv. It all just went. You fucking shite, you RP. I can't be held responsible for dodgy gear, all right? Come on, keep it together, man. You can't fuck with us, Flo. Finally, I thought I'd never get through to you. What the f... What's Torino, this? is that you? What's happening here? Torino? Listen, you gotta pull one last trick. Hold up, mate. Look, okay? hold up. One second. Communists at the gate, Carl. I'm tired of this, Torino. I'm outside. Let's take a ride. Now I'm eating things. Fuck me! Oh, hey, I gotta on? get out of here. You got this? Hey, dog. I gotta go hit a marketing meeting. I'm gonna catch you later. All right, my name goes, Sunshine. Yeah, sweet ass. Come on, you having that, Mac? You having that? I'm a die in the eye of the storm. That's my destiny. Well, no invite to the housewarming, huh, kid? I knew you'd come anyway. Yeah, well, that's not important right now. I'll bring you up to speed on the way. Get in. this gonna take? I got my own shit to worry about. Would you like to see your brother this week? Yeah, what can I do? You just gotta steal a military jet off an amphibious assault ship and use it to destroy a flotilla of spy ships. Nothing big. Oh man, you shit. When I shit you, Carl, there's a boat. All the gear you'll need is on board. I'll keep you briefed as you go. I ain't coming back from this one, am I? Yes, you are. Don't be ridiculous. Here, take this earpiece. Trust me, do as I say. You'll be home for a blowjob and a bologna sandwich. Carl would follow Torino's instructions to the letter, sneaking aboard the ship stealthily and proceeding to push his way to the hangar to acquire one of the military Hydra jets, needed to finish the operation. You see? You see? What did I tell you? It was a snap! Stone aircraft, prepare to be vaporized. Did you hear that? Prepare to be vaporized. They're a bunch of bullshit. Ignore them. They shouldn't you. It's an international incident. You're not a British tank. You should be fine. For real? Yeah, well, probably. Now make your way to the flotilla. You sink the fuckers. After destroying several pursuing jets, Carl would take the Hydra to various reservoirs and lakes in Bone County to annihilate supposed spy vessels, which we suspect may have in actuality been more rival government agents. Carl, having performed a physically and mentally grueling, not to mention highly improbable feat with his success, would curse Torino's name, who would in turn play dumb when asked about where to store the stolen military hardware. You see? Child's play! Fuck you, Torino! I never want to go through this again! I think I'm a Earl! Oh, what a big whiny. Want some cheese with that wine? Hey, you were spectacular. You know what? I'm beginning to think my little Carl's a double agent. Ooh. Shut up, Torino! Where you want this thing? What thing? I don't know what you're talking about. You stole it. Got nothing to do with me. I don't know what you're talking about. See you around. Torino! Torino! Shit! Having passed all of Mike's tests and completed every mission given to him, Mike would be more than impressed with CJ by this time. It remains unclear if Torino had been using Carl for each of his progressively more dangerous jobs, expecting the gangster to die in the line of duty, or if his confidence in CJ's abilities were truly so high that he believed he would return each time. Either way, following Carl's theft of the Hydra and destruction of several spy ships, he would finally be ready to make good on his earlier promises of releasing Sweet from prison. He would show up one last time at Mad Dog's mansion to give CJ the good news, but not without his characteristic wit and sarcasm. I don't care how, I care when. As in now, you hear me? Hey man, what the f
Hello, boss man. Taking care of business, I see. Torino, fuck you. Almost lost my life out there for you. I got just one tiny little thing for you to do, and then I'm out of your life forever. You know what? I'm tired of your fucking little jobs. Ah, right, will you stop? This is pathetic. Come on, you're embarrassing yourself. Come on, put it down. Don't be ridiculous, okay? Hey, I got a little surprise for you here. You ready for this? Huh? Answer it. Hello? Carl, Smee, Sweet. Oh, Sweet. I don't know what happened. They just released me. No idea what's going on. But I'm in the square outside the precinct in Congress. All right, you hold tight. I'll be right there. All right. So what was that little job you was talking about, Torino? I just want you to go pick up your brother. Get out of here. What became of Mike Torino following this is anybody's guess. Given his cautious nature and otherwise indecipherable record, it seems entirely possible, if not likely, that Mike simply continued his foreign intervention and general government espionage for many years after 1992. But we cannot know for certain, as his name never again appears in any official statements or records from the CIA. While it isn't entirely out of the realm of possibility that he continues to operate to this day, given his clearly cushy CIA salary, it seems far more likely that he has retired by now, and perhaps lives out his final days in the comfort and luxury of his Tierra Robata ranch. However, it also seems equally likely that as a man so clearly convinced of his own necessity to the status quo, he would still be operating to this day. So the next time you visit San Andreas, be sure to keep your data off and your mirrors checked. You never know who's watching, or listening, or both. Mike Torino was a dyed-in-the-wool American imperialist, and when speaking honestly with Carl Johnson, we presume, wouldn't make allusions to being anything else. He was motivated, it seems, almost exclusively by his belief in American cultural and military superiority, which likely influenced his decision to join the CIA to begin with. As a government agent, his role as he saw it was making hard decisions, putting bad guys on other bad guys, and sometimes allowing for collateral damage where necessary. He was actively involved in political subterfuge in Latin America, having connections in Panama and all across parts of Central and Southern America, and may have played a substantial role in reshaping that part of the world for American interests as a result. Though he was always cautiously vague about the nature of his work in foreign nations, it seems undoubtedly true that he was who he claimed to be, given his ability to act in such bold defiance of local laws without penalty or pursuance. Being far from morally pure, Mike Torino would see little to no problem with using the illicit drug trade to fuel his operations elsewhere, and single-handedly contributed more to Los Santos' crack epidemic through sheer volume thanks to his Panamanian connections. In fact, while he was certainly not the only major supplier of cocaine to San Andreas in the 90s, he was at the height of the syndicate's power the most successful, being the main supply to the largest distribution network in the state through Melvin Big Smoke Harris. Mike was also well aware of corruption at every branch of the government, including being aware of Frank Tenpenny and Eddie Pulaski's role in Ralph Pendlebury's death, and possibly even their role in the death of Carl's mother. This may be further proof that Mike had been watching Carl for some time prior to their meeting in San Fierro. However, it still remains unclear how long Mike had been planning to try and recruit CJ, and if he was ever truly caught off guard, or merely pretending to be. Unlike Tenpenny and Pulaski, however, Mike was not corrupted by his power at least not in the literal sense of the word, and seemed to genuinely believe in the causes he was fighting for, even if they were incredibly destructive. He was not above blackmail, murder of rival government agents, or propagating a drug epidemic, but at the end of the day he was also a man of his word, who no matter how twisted his beliefs and methods were, followed through on his promises, such as the early release of Sweet Johnson from prison. Ultimately, very little is known about Mike Torino the man, with far more but still very little known about Mike Torino the government agent. He was a controlling, intelligent, and mysterious man whose true motivations can only ever be speculated upon. But at the very least, he kept his promises, which is far more than we can say for most violently disruptive G-men.
As we almost always say before this part of the show, the numbers we have obtained through rigorous research on Mike Torino must be taken with a grain of salt, as most of our knowledge comes from that brief period in 92 when he was associated with Carl Johnson. If we assumed that 92 was a fairly typical year for an agent like Torino, and extrapolated that into our data, it would quickly become clear just how dangerous a man he truly was. That being said, we have compiled only the known crimes we believe him responsible for in and around San Andreas in the early 1990s, starting with drug dealing, drug distribution, conspiracy accessory drug dealing, and conspiracy accessory murder. When starting up the Loco Syndicate and allowing for collateral damage such as the gang member that T-Bone Mendez murders. Conspiracy accessory drug dealing when meeting with other high-ranking members of the Syndicate in Angel Pine. Drug dealing, conspiracy accessory drug dealing, and conspiracy accessory murder when being kidnapped during a deal and leading his men to the kidnappers slash thieves, who are promptly killed. Conspiracy accessory drug distribution and conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Carl Johnson to protect drug shipments en route to the crack factory from the attacking Da Nang boys. Conspiracy accessory drug dealing when planning to attend another local syndicate meeting at Pier 69, which is crashed by Carl Johnson and Cesar Vialpando. Conspiracy public endangerment, conspiracy grand theft auto, and conspiracy murder when hiring Carl Johnson and Cesar Vialpando to hijack a rival agency's truck on the San Fierro freeway. Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Carl to protect a cargo helicopter from numerous attacking agencies or enemy actors. Conspiracy accessory murder and conspiracy accessory destruction of government property when giving Carl the clearance to murder several rival agents and destroy their Andromeda cargo plane. And Conspiracy accessory murder, conspiracy accessory theft of government property, and conspiracy accessory terrorism when hiring Carl to steal a Hydra jet and take down several flotillas of enemy spy ships in Bone County. Once again, we must emphasize that this likely only represents a small fraction of the havoc and destruction that could be tied back to Mike Torino, and does not even account for his instrumental role in the death of thousands of addicts across the state or the ramifications of his potentially destructive regime building in Latin America. Mike Torino may have been true to his word often enough, but it must not be forgotten that he was also beyond destructive, and debates surrounding the ethics and efficacy of his particularly cold approach continue to rage on to this day. Whether you love him or you hate him, it could not be said that Mike Torino was not terrifyingly good at his job. Why did the government resort to using the crack epidemic as a means of funding their foreign operations? Was it simply a lesser of two evils case where if somebody was going to do it, it might as well be them? Or have they simply been deceiving us all for their own profit our entire lives? Some say it's a loaded question, but I say America is a dangerous place, folks, and you never know if your dietary habits and odd proclivities are being monitored by state actors right at this very moment. Stay indoors, people, and tape over all of your webcams. You never know who might be watching you whittle away in abject isolation, just waiting for the right moment to wash your brain. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of Grand Theft Auto Biographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching.